if, if you've been watching me through the years, um, you know my stance on murder. I do not believe in, in second chances when it comes to murder. I mean, I, when people are, are sentenced to 20 years for taking someone else's life after, like, planning it and doing it on purpose, I don't understand when that happens. But we see it from time to time. I mean, it's more common there's life without parole, sometimes a death penalty. But there are cases and times where killers, literal killers, are being given a second chance. I personally don't believe in it. I'm a former prosecutor, but I tell you that all the time. Um, there's another scenario, I think, where you could put a couple words together in our system of justice and say, maybe that's someone else who doesn't deserve a second chance. When you put the words serial and rapist together, serial rapist, okay? Well, let's think about what is this? That's someone who is raping over and over and over and over again. And from covering cases involving sex offenders, one thing has is, is, is become very clear to me through the years is that this is one brand of felon that doesn't get better. They get worse. They actually get worse. They are wired differently. They see the world differently. And many of them have admitted having this uncontrollable impulse that drives them to their crimes. Now, let me add one more word to the serial rapist we're talking about tonight. And that is child rapist. 13-year-old girl was the victim that he was that he was convicted of, of, of sexually assaulting, 13 years old. And now tonight we sit here and a man named Richard Gilmore, you know, sometimes I don't mention the names of the, of the offenders, like the mass killers, the, the shooters and the school shooters. Now, this is one you want to know the name because he might be free very, 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 very soon in Portland, Oregon. So let's get some more details on this because I saw the headline today, I went nuts. I want to get specifics. Joining us tonight in Portland, Oregon, criminal justice reporter for the Oregonian, Oregonian uh, Maxine Bernstein is with us. Maxine, thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. And I want you to, I don't know if I got all the facts straight here. Um, I'm too out of my mind tonight to be thinking straight when it comes to this particular story and situation. So why don't you tell us um, what exactly is going on with this man, Richard Gilmore? What did he do? And is he actually going to get out? And if so, why and who made that decision? Sure, thanks for having me. So um, Richard Gilmore, he's um, known as the Jaga Rapist. And he had attacked nine girls and women in the late 70s and 80s in Portland and its suburbs. But he was only convicted of one rape, and that was the 1980 six rape of a 13 year old girl named Tiffany Edens in her home in what, Troutdale, a suburb of Portland. And he was convicted a year later in 1987. And at that time he was sentenced uh, for rape one and burglary one and sex abuse, sentenced to a minimum of 30 years and a maximum of 60 years. And under state law at that time, it was up to the state parole board to determine the actual determinant amount of time he would serve. And a year after the uh, parole board decided to uh, cut his term in half, they felt that a consecutive sentence of, um, for the rape one and the Berg one wasn't appropriate. Um, and every two years he had a uh, parole board hearing in which they determine whether he's um, able to be um, supervised uh, in the community and whether he, or whether he would be a danger. And um, in 19, uh, I'm sorry, in 2007, the parole board voted to release him. Um, his victim, Tiffany Edens, immediately her family and with the uh, support of the county DA's office sued the parole board to block his release at that time, that was 2007, 
Um, and their argument was that the victims hadn't been notified and they deserve to be notified and deserve to speak and challenge um, his release at the parole hearing. And they won that right. And um, his release was, was denied and a new hearing was held. And then every successive two years, the hearing was held up until 2016 where um, a new, uh, the parole board ultimately voted to deny his release. And instead of setting the next parole hearing two years later, they voted to defer his release until 2023, which would have been January. That was his release date for 2023, having served um, 36 years or so. But with good time, his release date was set for December 22nd of this year. And if he had been, if he were to be released December 22nd, he would be released without any supervision. So the parole board decided to move that up about a week or so. And so his date that he will be released is December 16th to transitional housing in the Portland area. Now, the, the, so, so if we look at this original sentence, 30 to 60 years, it's really a year after that the state parole board by law had the power to determine a sentence, not a judge, but like a parole board. Is, is so, so if we look at this, the entirety of these circumstances, that would be the first place where um, this, this potential sentence was cut to a point where this guy has a chance to get out. Yes, that's exactly right. At that time, that was the law. And at this point, they have no choice, but they have to release him at this point because of what was done he by the parole board? He has served his maximum, yeah, under, under the law, he has served his maximum sentence. He will have served his maximum sentence with good time as of December 22nd of this year. Um, what his victims are very concerned about is that he will be released under a uh, classification as a low level, first level one, low level sex offender. And under that classification, only um, there's no notifications that are required to be made to the community of his release. Um, if he was a highest level uh, sex offender, level three, the state and county that he's released to would have to alert uh, the neighborhood, the residents, uh, before he moved in and with every change of address. Um, so that's a big concern of, of his victims. So, and, and you, you mentioned that they moved, they gave him an even earlier date so they could have some level of control over him when he is released. How much control, what's the nature of it and how long will it last? And, and, I'm really wondering, like, when can he just kind of, like, disappear into the wind? So those are all good questions. They, uh, the state parole board said they would release him to the active supervision of Multnomah County, which uh, is where Portland's located. For uh, the active supervision would last for three years. The actual conditions haven't yet been set, but they could include regular... Um, check-ins with a parole officer, probation officer. Um, also, it could include GPS monitoring, um, and it would include undoubtedly uh, no contact with any of his victims. Now that active supervision can continue for up to three years, but he will remain on some type of supervision with conditions that haven't yet been set until um, 2034. Maxine Bernstein from the Oregonian, criminal justice reporter. You have all the facts, all the information, amazing reporting. Really do appreciate it. Thank you. All right, folks, let's bring in our think tank, get some perspective tonight. Joining us in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor Al Wunsch III is with us. In Stanford, Connecticut, criminal defense attorney Darnell Crossland and in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, family law attorney Jennifer Brandt. Great to see everyone tonight. Um, this, 
I mean, you've got to go back in a time machine to, to, to really go after the people who are responsible for allowing a serial rapist to be set free. It's that state parole board who made the decision one year after incarceration that, oh, let's cut his time in half. Let's cut it in half. Al, I think a condition of his release should be that we should find out where the state parole board members from 1988, where they're living now, and he should live next door to them. Well, Ben, you know, first I want to say happy Columbus Day to everybody. Absolutely. Happy indigenous, happy indigenous People's Day to everybody. And ironically, it's also the day that Custer was buried up at West Point, who, by the way, I say ironically because Columbus was his favorite explorer and he was killed by the indigenous people. So it's an interesting scenario there. But going back to the situation with regards to this, it is absurd that he is not a, a, a tier three. A tier one makes no sense to me. Tier three has very specific protocols for somebody like that, where they basically have to go neighbor door to door and say, you know, guess what? This is me and I'm a sex offender and I'm gonna be living next door to you. And it's more than, you know, reporting it just to the police station. Tier one, it's reporting it to the police station. Tier three, especially because this man's proclivity for young women, I mean, 17 years of age, 13 years of age, things along those, those lines. Those are girls. Let's call, let's call, I mean, it's 13 years old, you're a girl. girl. That's, it's you're girl. a girl. I, you're definitely girls, I agree with you on that. But they would, you know, the schools need to be warned about this guy, okay? There needs to be precautions set up there in the community for this kind of a, a just horrendous rogue that, you know, I agree with you. He doesn't deserve to be out, unfortunately. The sentence is what the sentence is, and I would rather him be out with these precautions than on December 22nd you know, or December 16th, them opening the doors and then he's free to go. And you said about him disappearing in the wind. I wish he would disappear, okay, because then we, we really shouldn't have a person like this in society. You know, uh, Darnell, um, 36 years locked up, I mean, he's been waiting for this moment. The parole board was trying to do everything they could to set him free. I mean, back in 2007, didn't even want to tell the victims what was going on. Just set him free, set him free. Um, I can't imagine someone who's a serial rapist for 36 years locked up with nothing but other men. The first thing and only thing on his mind when he gets out. And I, I, I am scared for the people of Portland tonight. I would agree. And, you know, what comes to mind... Uh, is it feels like we're living in a banana republic because the more we look at these bizarre rulings throughout these quote unquote United States, it seems like we're anything but united. And sometimes you say it's a race issue and you show disparities, but more often we're seeing it's not even a race issue. It's just a state issue. Um, and, and here in Connecticut, uh, we had the Century Park Five that started in New York. They got that wrong. Um, and those young men were in jail. The victim was a victim who uh, a young lady from here in Connecticut, Fairfield County. Um, and then you look at the type of registration they had, even in that case. These are lifetime registrations. These are not for law enforcement purposes only. Um, and now you get a case where this guy admitted to raping nine women. And we're even talking about what type of registration, what type of tears. It should be automatically that he gets the uh, highest of tears. He admitted it. Um, and then you, you find the disparities across the country and it just, it's alarming. Now, I have to say as the reporter, she was very, very uh, thorough and very smart and, and she connected to a lot of things that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, they have something called TS, which is transition supervision. The whole idea with TSing is that even though your sentence might be this long, uh, six months, 10 months, a year, they want to TS you a little earlier so that way you can acclimate back into society. And so what that does, it looks like it's a reward that you get out earlier, but there's a re it's a reward in one sense, but it has a purpose in another sense that they can start to show you what a debit card looks like, uh, allow you to take some uh, classes and stuff like that. Uh, but it does look like it cuts the sentence down. And just lastly, I would say the quote unquote correctional facility is another word as just as well as serial killer or serial rapist, correctional facility. The idea is, are we correcting anyone? And if we're correcting them, then we shouldn't have no problem with them coming back. You can't the correct them. No, sex correct. offenders don't get corrected. I, 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 they're the worst. They, it, it's the way they're wired. And it, I, I, just, I just don't believe 
that a serial child rapist gets better. Well, well, Vinny, you always attack Al on the idea with the with the uh, with the Parkland shooting it. He he doesn't get a vote. He can't he can't fight against the legislature of capital punishment. You don't get a vote on this, Vinny. Um, it's it's what it is. The sentence. It has to end. They can't, unless you're going to change the law no. and say it should be lifetime. 60 years. It should have ended after 60 years. Then we wouldn't have to worry about it. He'd die in prison. That's what I'm really saying here tonight. Okay. I'll but, give you that. Okay. Good. Jennifer Brandt, <laughs> we use up so much time, but you've got some. Go ahead. Well, I agree with my panelists tonight. Um, I think this guy should stay in prison. I agree with you, Vinny. I don't think there's any place for him in society. Um, the only thing I can say is that, look, the, the good news, if there's any good news, he is getting out early and he will be supervised. If we waited until his sentence was completed, he would just be completely out on the street after finishing up his entire sentence. So I think the supervision is good. At least someone's watching over him. I don't think it gives a lot of comfort to his new neighbors, but nonetheless... Yeah. Um, hopefully someone will be uh, monitoring what's going on with this. Yeah, and, I, and I think the first, well, it's a bunch of first things he's going to want to do. But I know one thing that's going to be on his checklist is learning how to use high-speed Internet. And I wonder what he'll <laughs> use that for. I wonder. No idea. Huh. All right. <laughs>